side, all across the five boroughs. So we have pop-up sites. So we're partnership, uh, providing partnership with churches, local churches, as well as schools. So the problem we face is that the schools reopen, have been reopening first the middle schools and now the high school. So we've had to relocate those sites you know, ar around the city. So uh, one instance, you know, we, we had a site in Harlem at uh, A. Philip Randolph High School, which is by City College. So we just relocated that site to City College. And so uh, me, I'm spearheading the Metropolitan uh, Council of the NWC Health Chairs, and we're, we're working with the city of New York so that all our health chairs and the committee members have been trained. Now that we're authorized vaccine schedulers. So we have the ability uh, to go directly into the system, uh, in the system, the New York City system, and schedule uh, people from communities, you know, impacted, such as you know the Black and Brown communities. And so, what we've been doing, we've been working with the senior groups, we've been working with the local churches, senior centers, uh, New York City Housing Authority, to not only just provide forums such as this and educate staff and and and, and, and clients of those communities but also provide them access to the vaccine. And so uh, New York City also has a program now, if you, you're disabled, you can't leave the house, they will come to you and, and, and vaccinate you in the home. So these are the steps that you have to do when there are uh, access points that are clogged for certain communities. And so just like we talk about food deserts, there are vaccine deserts throughout the city. And so this is what uh, our community and civic partners have to do to make sure everyone uh, has a fair and equitable distribution of vaccines. Absolutely. And I would like to walk people through what exactly it's like to get the vaccine. So um, I'll turn it back to you, Nurse Hill. Um, you know, when people are going to your site to get vaccinated, they very often have to stay for a good 15 or 30 minutes after they actually get the vaccine. So can you explain to us what the process is and why people have to do that? So the process for the 15 minute or the 30 minute um, observation is what we call it, is to just observe the patient for any adverse reactions that they may have um, to the vaccine. There are many questions that are asked in the survey of the patient prior to them getting the vaccine. One of the question, one of the questions is, have you ever experienced a severe adverse reaction to any medications or food? in which you needed to go to the hospital and have an, epi, an epinephrine pen administered. So when the patient asks, you know, answers those questions, the nurse has you know, an idea of whether that patient would stay the normal 15 minutes, which would be for a person with no adverse reaction in the past, or it would be 30 minutes for someone who has experienced some type of reaction to a vaccine. And what are some of the common reactions? I know for me, I had two days of headache with the second um, dose. Can you explain what people would um, possibly um, encounter after getting the vaccine, whether it's the first or the second dose? So um, it would be body aches, headache, a fever, um, soreness in the arm is what I had for a few days, soreness and swelling. Okay, thank you. And of course, you know, we have a lot of uh, people still on the fence who haven't gotten the vaccine yet because there have been some rumors. So Dr. smalls Manti, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and maybe you can help dispel some of the myths that have been coming out about the uh, vaccine. So one of them is that you know, these, uh, John, not Johnson & Johnson, excuse me, that Moderna and Pfizer, which are mRNA technology, also known as messenger RNA technology, can cause alterations to people's DNA, which has made people concerned about getting um, either Moderna or Pfizer. So would you be able to uh, talk about how these vaccines work and let us know, is it true? Can my DNA be altered now that I've gotten my vaccine? The simple answer is no. The mRNA vaccines are just a tiny fragment of um, genetic code for um, a protein that is contained within the coronavirus. And so the mRNA enters your body. It gives your body the instruction, like the body recognizes it. 
it is made into a protein and your body is then able to say this is foreign, I don't recognize it and start building its immune defenses against it. And then the mRNA degrades very quickly within a few hours. And that's the reason why it has to be kept at very cold temperatures. So an analogy that I like to use is if you've ever seen the movie Mission Impossible, where the um, Tom Cruise's character gets his instructions um, for his mission, should he choose to accept it, he reads it. Um, just like he reads it, your body gets the mRNA instructions, it reads it, it says, all right, this is what I have to do. I have to build a st my defenses against the um, coronavirus. And then at the end, the tape, the message that Tom Cruise has says this message will self-destruct in five seconds. And essentially the mRNA self-destructs, degrades within a couple of hours. So it does not stay around in your body. It can't be um, go into your DNA, nothing like that. And just to maybe anticipate your question, maybe about how the Johnson & Johnson vaccine might work, it's just one step back from how the, um, it's a little bit different, but one step back from how the mRNA vaccines work. So the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is made out of an inactivated cold virus called adenovirus that has a piece of the COVID DNA um, in it that also then is converted to mRNA. The adenovirus is used as a protection for this little DNA fragment, um, makes it the vaccine itself a little bit more sturdy so it doesn't have to be kept at those very cold temperatures and it helps build a even greater immune response. So when you get the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, it goes into your cells, the DNA is made into RNA, um, just a piece um, of the COVID, um, you know, of the COVID protein is made that your body recognizes and builds its immune defenses against. And then again, um, the vaccine degrades. So it does not stay in your body for a long time. It does not become part of your cells or anything like that. And uh, one other question, why is the Johnson & Johnson just one shot? You know, the other vaccines are two. Why is that only require one? When they were doing the clinical trials for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, they found early on that just one shot was enough to develop a strong immune response that they needed, um, that they desired. So that is fortunate because it makes it a lot easier for people to get the vaccine if they only have to come one time. Earlier in the clinical trials for the mRNA vaccines, they found after one shot, um, it didn't develop as strong as an immune response as they wanted. So they had to give a booster or a second shot, um, which is why it's two shots. And we have a lot of vaccines that we get nowadays that are um, you know, either one shot or you have to get boosters. Um, a lot of us don't rem remember getting them as children, you know, um, whether that's be from, you know, the day that you're born versus um, MMR or Tdap, you know, maybe people remember getting boosters for that about every 10 years, but um, they found the mRNA vaccine that they needed a booster pretty quickly after the first shot. Thank you. You made that really simple. I'm going to remember the Mission Impossible analogy. It really hit home. <laughs> um, so for people who get vaccinated, this question is for you, Mr. Boyce. Uh, you get an actual vaccine card. Um, what happens if somebody loses their card? Can they just get another one? And when they get it, what should they do with it? So uh, you, this card that you're referencing right here, it's the CDC vaccination card. So uh, when you go to get your first dose of the vaccine, Pfizer or Moderna, or even the JJ, you would get this card. So if you lose this card, you can get it replaced by returning to the site where you receive that uh, vaccination and they will replace it for you free of charge and everything like that too. So that, that's important to know, but a secondary way that you can always retain your records if you sign up for your electronic MyChart your MITRA electronic digital health record. And so every time you're vaccinated, whether it's the one dose Pfizer or the two dose, or five, uh, I mean, one dose J&J &J or the two dose one Moderna and Pfizer, it will be in your electronic record, digital record. 
So when they have that you no know, Celsius pass, actually your my chart is is would be like the Celsius pass. So it would be there in your electronic record. So you can you can definitely get a replacement wherever you got the dose. And then also to uh, some organizations like Staples are laminating these for free for you and everything like that. As an act of goodwill, uh, you can go in the Staples uh, and get it laminated for free, but you definitely can get it replaced. You know, you just return to the site which you receive your vaccine, they'll give it to you for free. And, uh, you know, we mentioned this earlier that at the sites that and I know also um, I'll pose this question to you as well as Nurse Hill, that at sites we're seeing more people that don't look like us as opposed to people of color, even in neighborhoods where we reside. So if Mr. Boyce and um, followed by Nurse Hill can comment on what you're seeing at your vaccine sites in terms of are people of color showing up? A lot of people are saying, oh, they're not coming because of Tuskegee, et cetera, et cetera. But are people of color showing up? So, so Mr. Boyce, I'll pose it to you and then Nurse Hill. Right, so, so everything you said is correct. You know, um, there, there's been the definite vaccine hesitancy, but the numbers are, are picking up polling. Uh, you know, we started in December giving out the vaccinations and everything. And what we saw, you know, the first couple of months, it was a four to one ratio, uh, meaning folks from outside those particular community, African American, Latino community that was coming to, in this case, the public, uh, public health safety hospitals, the safety net hospitals, the HAC hospitals public hospital to receive the vaccine. And they were first time users of services at the hospital. So they came, they were coming as far as Chappaqua where Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton lived and, and as well as Southampton, uh, the financial district, uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. And so we, we were seeing that and we still see uh, a significant high numbers. But in terms of uh, our community, the African-American Latino community, the numbers are now moving in the right direction. So that, that variance isn't as wide as it was initially, but all the city hospitals, as well as the pop-up sites in the, in the city have been seeing that same variance and everything like that too. But as we continue to educate our community and more information come out and like we do forums like we're doing today, you know, the, the numbers are changing, it's getting smaller the divide. And so even with the staff in, in the hospitals, you know, they've been hesitant, but, you know, initially we were ranked pretty low in terms of staff vaccinations, but, you know, we're moving in the right direction now. We're trending upward, so we're over 55% now. And so, but again, it, it takes education and also take credible leaders who are going out and partner with community um, groups and organizations such as, you know, Tau Omega to make a difference so that you can change minds. And what I've found too, with respect to family members, if you if you get the wife and, and to come, the husband will follow. If you get the wife and the kids, the husbands will follow and sons, so. Um, for, for Staten Island, I was working at one of the Northwell um, vaccine pods and we were seeing about 250 people a day. And it was just like, uh, mouth dropping that out of those 250 people a day, you, I was seeing maybe, if not, if so, five people of color at the site a day. And I was like, what is going on here? And we even had one of our faith-based leaders who's on my team, um, his church had a pod. And I drove by and I'm like, wow, okay, there's a lot of people on this line. I, I initially thought maybe it was a food, you know, pantry distribution. And it was basically mostly white people. And, you know, a few black and brown people, you know, scattered in. And this is in an all black area. And, you know, you don't see this many white faces over in this area that this vaccine pod was in. And as people stood online and the black and brown people started realizing it was a vaccine site they immediately got off the line because they thought maybe it was a food pantry as well. But this Tuesday, we had a vaccine pot at another pop-up at a, another church, and this was the second dose. And you see the difference. Like Zominic says, you see the difference in the numbers. I'm at Empire Outlets, which is down by the ferry. And it is um, city-run site, but Northwell staff is there. 
and you see a lot of black and brown people coming in. But you know what, we've been doing a lot of educating out here, you know, just boots to the ground, talking to people, you know, telling them the importance of getting the vaccine. And I think that this has been a major factor in the big turnaround, why you're seeing so many more black and brown people come out. And a lot of, you know, black and brown folk wanted to just wait it out and see what was going to happen to, you know, they wanted to wait a few months to make sure people, you know, weren't going to be, start dropping dead or anything like that, have really adverse reactions. So I think once you, like Dominic said, once you can start encouraging your families, educating them, and they start getting the vaccine, and then they're talking to their friends, that makes the whole big difference. But you know what, we just have to keep doing what you ladies have been doing, because this is awesome, because this is how we affect the change by educating and engaging um, this community. Yeah, another issue in our communities, and I've actually uh, spoken to some of my Asian and brothers, um, brothers and sisters who've said the same thing is status. So people who are undocumented are scared to get doc to uh, come in and get vaccinated uh, due to the fact that there are reports of you have to bring ID. If you don't bring ID, we won't give you a vaccine. So would you be able to shed light on this? Um, if, first, Nurse Hill, and then I'll turn it to you, Mr. Boyce, about uh, for people who are undocumented, is it true um, that they shouldn't come to get vaccinated because ICE will be called? And do they have to bring an ID when if they were coming to a North Well pod or a health and hospitals pod? I mean, definitely we want to see that group of people. And there is an agency out on Staten Island called Del Centro. And they've been partnering with another agency, Project Hospitality. And they've been registering people at their site to come to get the vaccine. So this week with those second doses, it was a large amount of Latino people coming. And you don't have to have the New York State ID you can have that New York City ID um, to get the vaccine as well. So, you know, I don't want people to be hindered by worrying about ICE. This, you know, is a pandemic and we need everyone um, vaccinated to get some kind of herd immunity. So I, you know, would hope people would not let that dismay them from coming out. Listen to the facts, go on 311 because that is where you're going to get information, don't listen to your friends and social media, you have to go to reputable sources so that you know exactly what you will need when you get to the vaccine pod. And I, and I would agree with what she said. Uh, pr primary, primary, the ID is used for two purposes, for verification of residency and, and for age, because as you know, each state has their own program. So what I've been seeing is you know, as New York was the first to get hit hard by the pandemic, we was also the first to respond, you know, you know uh, assertively in terms of the rollout of the vaccine and everything. So uh, the neighboring states, we've had people, citizens, and residents of the neighboring states try to come over to New York to get the vaccine. And so in terms of New York City, New York State, for New York City sites, and everything, you have to either live or work in New York City. So you, you can live in the outer, bur outer areas like Westchester, New Jersey, but you have to work there. But, but you know, again, so the ID is primary for verification that you are a resident of New York City and New York State and everything. You don't have to have a, a New York State license or anything like that. You can have the New York City ID card, which I have, you know, everything like that. You can also have an employee ID card and everything like that. But it's basically the verification because I, I can tell you that there is fraud in the system and, 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 and I, I see it on a daily basis in terms of people trying to pretty, pretty much skip the line in terms of uh, meeting the categories when they don't meet. And so that's the primary purpose. And this is not a new issue for hospitals because there's a law called Intala, which basically uh, states that it protects all patients uh, you know, it has nothing to do with your immigration status. You're, you're protected, you know, when you come into a hospital for care. And so it's, you don't have to, you know, identify yourself as a citizen, non-citizen, everything like that too. And so that's not really an issue for the sites that are at, at, at hospitals because we deal with the issue on a daily basis. But it's basically a primary a verification purpose for residency and age now that we had 
age 65, then went to 60, then 30, now we are age 16. So again, you have people that want to jump the line, you know, because, you know, they're 60 and right now we're still at the 65 threshold. And so that's serves as a primary verification. Yeah, I had a patient who did that and he had his feelings hurt. Right. They turned him away. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Boyce. Um, I just want to say again that we have a survey in the on our Facebook group. Please take the survey. It's a free survey. And also it's in the Zoom if you just join us. We have a question from Dr. Maria. How would each panelist convince a family member or friend to get vaccinated? In other words, what are what is your short elevator pitch? Any panelist can go first. <laughs> so I would say for myself, um, I realize that I've received dozens of vaccines throughout my life, and this is just another one. They're not new to me. Um, they're the reason why we live for you know so long, or we make it through childhood, you know. And it's really a modern miracle. And so when I think about how many people. Um, over 2 million have died from COVID and, you know, 500, you know, 550,000 plus here in America, um, getting a vaccine that for the most part is safe and I would have much less risk of a serious side um, effect happening from that as opposed to trying to risk my chance getting COVID being sick um, for a long time, you know, you know, whether it's a couple of months or even years with long haul syndrome. I just see it as I'd rather take my chances with the vaccine um, because I know COVID is bad. Um, basically for me, I've been using the same spiel with everyone. And, um, you know, I start out by telling them what I've seen in the hospital and how you can see that perfectly healthy young person um, just decompensate over hours or over a day. And, you know, it just breaks you apart. It just breaks you down. And it's like, you know, you can't believe that this has happened to this person. And we have to put, you know, everybody said, oh, Tuskegee, oh, this, I don't trust the government. And I've told people flat out, fine, you don't want to trust the politicians, don't trust them. They're not physicians, they're not scientists. These are the people that you have to trust. These are the people that have dedicated their lives, going to school, educating themselves and working hard to create um, this vaccine so that you know we can put a dent in this pandemic. And you know, that's been my that's been my spiel to everybody. I you know, you would never pick up a gun, right? A loaded gun and point it to your head and pull the trigger and play Russian roulette. So basically that's what you're doing when you don't get the COVID vaccine. It, you know, if you're exposed to it, you don't know how it will affect you. You might not, you may be asymptomatic. You might just have a headache. You might end up in the hospital and I see you on a vent. And, you know, the worst scenario is death. So listen, I think the vaccine is safe. I've had it. Um, the small side effects that you may get from the vaccine is better than the actual COVID symptoms. So this is what I've been telling everyone. And speaking to that, um, we have been seeing cases of people who are coming to the hospital testing uh, positive for COVID, even though um, they have gotten vaccines. So Dr. Smalls, Manti, can you comment on that? Because I think to speaking to Aaron um, Hill's point, a lot of people think I'm vaccinated, I'm not gonna get COVID. So can you explain what exactly the vaccination is doing in terms of our defenses um, which are uh, to COVID? Yeah, so the vaccine, um, again, gives you great protection, but it does take a little bit of time for that protection to build up. On average, it's about two weeks after you've had your last shot in the vaccine series. So it's two weeks after your last shot for Moderna or Pfizer, or it's two weeks after you get the Johnson & Johnson vaccine if you've already received it. And so um, after that two-week window, you are considered fully vaccinated. 
But the point of the vaccines is to prevent serious illness and death. So the but you might encounter the virus, your body might see it, and it you know really tries to fight it, and might you know, completely wipe it out before you even have a detectable infection. It may not get to completely wipe it out, but you could still have a very, you know, weak or mild infection as opposed to a really serious, uh, devastating infection, hospitalization, um, or even death. And in the clinical trials, you know, the vaccine prevented um, people from getting, was 100% effective in preventing people from getting serious, um, you know, hospitalization and death. I have a follow-up question for you. There are several variants that are here in the New York City area and unfortunately spreading in other parts of the country and the world. There's the UK variant, the Brazilian variant, the South African variant. So even though we have these increasing numbers based on what uh, Mr. Boyce and RN Hill are saying about, you know, we're doing better with the vaccinations, why are there cases going up? Lately, there's been a spike, especially here in New York City, Michigan. Why are the cases going up if more people are getting vaccinated? We are in a race against time. Vaccines, I mean, viruses are very good at adapting. And, you know, that is what they do. They're not, they can't live on their own. They have to infect, you know, another cell, another person in order to um, keep replicating and survive. And so it's survival of the fittest for the vaccines and we're for the viruses. And we are seeing more um, fit um, viruses um, develop. And so what we know is that the UK variant, the, uh, the ones from uh, South Africa, you know, they are able to spread a little bit more easily. And it's not conclusive, but there are some data suggesting that um, some of the variants like the UK variant might be more deadly. And so even though we're vaccinating, um, we're just not at the rate where we can outstrip um, the rate of the virus yet because there are still so many people that have um, infections. And so we're really in a race against time. And that's why it's important that even though so many people are vaccinated, we still continue to take effective measures. Right now, even if the Johnson & Johnson vaccine remains on pause, the um, White House is estimating that we would have enough vaccines for all adults by the end of May. You know, that's such great news. That's only a few more weeks for us to continue um, to do the proper safety measures until we can all get vaccinated, you know, if eligible. Of course, we're still waiting for the vaccine to be authorized for children, but, you know, it's going to take a while until everyone can be vaccinated. And while it happens, the, vac the viruses can still mutate and spread. And that's why, um, you know, the, vi the variants are spreading like they are. I would like to add too that we, we, we live in a global city that has five airports, uh, 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 international travel. We have, we have the ports, you know, the cruise ships which spin on ports, but basically in, in the New York area, we have Newark International, we have JFK, LaGuardia and everything. And also people are, are, are starting to travel again. And because every state have different rules and everything, some, you know, don't comply at all. Some states and their governors don't comply at all. And so we, we have that travel. If you look at every major holiday that just we went through and everything, you know, it was record breaking numbers at, the, at those airports and everything. They, they didn't heed the CDC and, and Dr. Fauci's warning people where well, they, they was out. Yeah, I mean, you look at spring break down at, in South Beach. I, and, and so, and you know, when we hear the UK variant, the Brazilian, you know, all these different variants, that's because people are traveling and they're coming in contact with these folks, then they're going back home and they're bringing it to New York City, they're bringing it to New Jersey, Connecticut, and so on and so forth. And so that's why, you know, you know, as she said, we're in a race against time. And if we don't keep the lid on, it's just, unfortunately, it's gonna to continue to spread unevenly across the country. Thank you. And we especially need to spread this message as um, this, it's getting warmer People have fatigue, so everybody will just want to go out and believe that if I get one dose, I, it's safe for me to travel, it's safe for me to do whatever I want, but that's not the case. 
I also want to put a plug in now that if you're just joining us, could you please take the survey that's in the chat on Zoom or the chat on our Facebook group? And the question that we have from Zoom is, what is the efficacy rate for people of color and or minority groups? Um, I read that J&J &J was lowest than what is on social media. You know what, well, it, the question asks about persons of color. So in all the clinical trials uh, so far, they had a, you know, a population of, of persons of color, you know, more so than they have in the past with clinical trials and everything. So in just in terms of overall uh, uh, efficacy weight of, of Pfizer was 95% they found and, and Moderna 94. And then when you move to J and J, it varies. I've, I've seen it somewhere from in the sixties to the high seventies. And so, you know, that's including everybody. I don't know if they looked at it as a subcategory with just minorities. And if anybody knows that information, they can add in. But that's overall, that's where if you look at them in terms of, you know, how affected they are, that's how the numbers they go. I have not specifically seen those numbers parsed out, but like you said, there were um, nearly representative numbers that you have in the general population in the clinical trials, um, which is very important. And then that's more so what you're looking at. And when they looked, when they would have analyzed the data, um, you know, there was nothing that came out to suggest it was better for one versus another um, um, at this time. And, and they did, they did include people with comorbidities, like pre-existing conditions in there too, you know, and it was the, the age variance too, from very young to very old too. So they tried to like, you know, make it across the board representative of the population mm -hmm. even by ethnicity and race. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then probably the past month, we've had some controversy regarding uh, most recently, obviously, J&J, &J, but even overseas, not here, but in Europe and uh, Caribbean and other places where they're doing more AstraZeneca uh, vaccination, there has been some um, controversy surrounding these increased risk of, risk of getting clots. Um, should those who've already received, you know, our, our friends and family overseas who might have already received AstraZeneca or even people here in the U.S. who've already received the J&J, &J, should they be worried if they've already got the vaccine about these clots that uh, Maya mentioned earlier that have, we've been seeing? So, that's so I would say that, you know, blood clots are a very serious thing. Um, that lead to heart attacks, strokes, of course, in everyday life. But the blood clots that they are seeing associate, possibly associated, they have not had any definitive um, conclusions reached yet. But what they are seeing now are numbers that you would expect to see in the general population. The thing to know about these blood clots, um, the cerebral venous, uh, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, um, are what they're seeing are blood clots in your head. And the symptoms usually appear within a week to two weeks after getting the vaccine. So if you're outside of that window, it's very unlikely that you're going to necessarily have that type of uh, side effect. And what every person, um, just for America, they've had six people out of about 7 million people um, that have received the Johnson & Johnson vaccine have this um, CBT and, and the AstraZeneca is a little bit more, but they've had you know, over 30 million people receive that vaccine. Um, but for here in America, uh, the people um, were, um, like we said, women 18 to 48, relatively young, um, all of them were white at this time um, that have been identified. And the symptoms were all of them had headaches some people also had some um, pain in their abdomen or their back um, because they developed blood clots in other parts of their bodies. Some might have had the general malaise that is normally experienced um, with vaccines. But um, if you're out of that two week window, generally consider yourself okay. But if you have any of those symptoms that I mentioned, you should go and um, seek medical attention. Um, again, I wanna just highlight that um, again, 
blood clots are a very serious thing, but right now the numbers that we are seeing are not out of the ordinary for the general population. And there are many things, even many other medications that increase your risk of blood clots. And so they are parsing through all of that people's medical history. You know, you have a higher risk of blood clots from taking birth control pills, from smoking, from being pregnant, um, from COVID, it's, you know, like 16 to 21% of people that are in the hospital with COVID develop blood clots. So the risk is much, much higher with the illness that we're trying to prevent than from the vaccine. And one thing that the FDA um, has actually said is that one reason why they made this announcement, you know, they want to be really upfront with everybody. Maybe this would not have made such a big news um, a couple of years ago, but because everyone is very focused, they want to be upfront with people and they wanted to really let doctors know to watch out for this phenomenon because uh, the treatment for this is a little bit different than for your typical blood clot. And they just want everyone to pause, take notice, and then the doctors can figure it out. You know, you don't have to worry about what the treatment is, but they want you, if you have these symptoms and show up to the emergency room to mention, hey, I got the vaccine. So doctors are thinking, okay, let's keep this on what we call our differential diagnosis. One of the possible things that somebody could have. Yeah, I was listening to a show today and they were saying that the pretty much the reason why they were putting this on pause, like you said, is that so when we see patients like this, we're not give, giving them the blood thinner heparin, which can actually make the condition worse, as opposed to the fact that they're afraid that the condition is really a problem. So I, that's the same thing I was um, hearing from a couple of experts this morning, uh, just to echo and reinforce your point. So thank you. Um, one of the other questions that often comes up is for patients, and I'll pose this to you, Nurse Hell, is do I have COVID or is this a reaction to the vaccine? So there's some people who have been exposed to COVID around the time of their vaccinations, and they're not sure if when they're having the fevers and the headache, is it the vaccine or is it COVID? Um, so how would you be able to distinguish um, between the two? So with the vaccine, you're going to experience the symptoms of body ache, fatigue, um, headache, fever, you're going to experience that one to three days. The symptoms of COVID are going to be experienced over a longer period of time. And the symptoms are going to progress because they're going to progress with high grade fevers, um, coughing, inability, difficulty breathing. So that's basically how you're going to tell the symptoms the difference in the symptoms. Anything after three days, then you should, you know, start thinking about is possible that is COVID and not the um, side effects of the vaccine. Thank you. And I just wanted to go back to a point that was made earlier about one of the reasons why we need to do these vaccines is we need to reach herd immunity. So um, Dr. Nurse Hill, you brought this up. So I'm going to pose it to Dr. Smalls. Manti, can you explain to us in lay terms, what is this herd immunity that Dr. Fauci is always talking about? And are we almost there? I mean, Nurse Hill and Mr. Boyce have said we're getting vaccines in people's arms. Are we almost at the point of getting to herd immunity? Herd immunity is when enough people in the population are immune to the virus, either through vaccination or from natural infection. When you reach herd immunity, even if you have a few um, people that have coronavirus, when the virus goes to infect somebody else, it'll reach somebody that has his defenses built up and it can infect and then the virus eventually will, you know, die off if they can't find a host, it can't continue to replicate. So we are trying to get to a, a number where there are enough people um, that have defenses built up that um, the virus has nowhere to go, no safe haven. Right now they're estimating it could be 70 to 90%, but if these variants really get out of hand, we might be at that higher number. And so, you know, that's a lot of people um, that need to get vaccines. And on average, about 90% of the um, population does have their complete vaccination series for all the other diseases. So, um, and that's because vaccinations start in childhood and it's, you know, done and checked routinely when you're in schools. You know, you can't go to public school um, without having vaccines and, um, or, you know, to colleges, many professions require it. This is 
started back in the 1850s um, and America requiring vaccinations um, in order for the whole population to be protected. So um, it is going to really be everyone's collective effort that helps us to reach herd immunity. And we want to reach it quickly before the virus has a chance to mutate where we have virus that, uh, variants that cannot be controlled. Um, because then we'll risk that we'll have the chance of maybe having to get the vaccine every year, kind of like we do for the flu, that's not bad, but you can also have variants emerge that you can't really um, combat that well or are very challenging to combat. You know, one of the reasons I did HIV vaccine and, uh, research and one of the reasons why it's been so hard to develop a vaccine is because it mutates so quickly. So we really wanna to get to that herd immunity as quick as we can. Thank you, Dr. Smalls-Manzi. There is a question in the chat um, on Facebook. I think that one is directed at you. So it's the, the individual said, hello, I received both Moderna vaccines and experienced severe reactions, including hair loss, bald spots. Should I anticipate a similar reaction to the booster shot when it is released? That is an, a reaction that I have not, um, seen or read about, but I'm not saying, it, you know, it could be related to the vaccine. I don't know. I would say the best thing to do is to talk to your doctor to try to discuss what's going on there. Um, but if you had it, you know, to the first two shots, it does lend to, um, it, it, it could happen again if you have the booster. Um, if there is definitely a cause. But again, that's not a side effect that I have come across or read about in any of the um, data that I have read through. Um, and, you know, if that is something that you are experiencing, though, you should report it to your doctor and to the CDC. And you can do this on your own with going to the um, vaccine adverse reaction um, site and putting that in because that helps um, all the researchers to know um, to look out for these symptoms. But I would definitely speak with your doctor um, about that. And that site that she mentioned is on the back of your card, the adverse CDC adverse reaction is on the back of the, the card when you get vaccinated. And then also uh, Mr. Boyce was nice enough to uh, post the information if you guys are looking for vaccines, the phone numbers are in here um, as well as website information. If you need a vaccine or if you know somebody who needs a vaccine, there's the vaccine hotline at 877-VAX-4NYC. Again, that's 877-VAX-VAX, the number 4NYC. Um, there are also the websites www.nyc covid vaccine finder uh, www.turbovax.com which is also um, a great site they had gotten shut down by the city about a week ago but we're, it's back up it's you back can up. also find him on twitter in case the site gets web shot down again he gives you great real-time information of how you can get uh, access to vaccines um, in different parts of the city so those are definitely great resources um, I was just going to close by asking each one of you, what's the one thing that you think that we as responsible citizens of this global world can do to try to decrease uh, this COVID and how we can get back to normal? Because a lot of people want to get back to normal. I'm not going to ask you when, because I don't think any of us know that at this point, but what, in your opinion, can we do to get back to normal? So I'll start off at the very least, we, we should continue to wear our masks. And, and wash our hands and keep social distance as much as possible. I mean, I, I've seen the very worst of it, you know, in last spring where, you know, I saw over 300 people die, you know, in a community hospital and in a hospital was almost 100% uh, COVID patients. And the fact that I had to, you know, live in a hotel for more than a month and I couldn't see my family and everything like that too. The fact that we at this point is, is, is a wonderful trajectory we are on. I don't want us to stay on it, but in order to do that, you know, at the very least, if, if I would like for everybody to get vaccinated, but that's not feasible, 100% vaccination, but at the very least, you know, everybody can, you know, stay masked up, wash your hands and, and follow the CDC guidelines in, in terms of, you know, how you protect yourself and your family, because you may not get 
COVID or, or have symptoms of it, but you know, your loved ones may be impacted by you. And so that's why it's important for all of us to do our part to protect our families, not just ourselves. Um, you know, I have the same sentiments as Dominic and, you know, I, I definitely wearing the mask, wiping down the high usage areas. I even still wipe down um, my groceries when I bring them, when I bring them into the house. Um, you know, keeping that social bubble, you know, of people that, you know, are basically living the way you're living and not, you know, being out and hanging out in large crowds of people you know, it's important for us to see family and be with them, but we still have to remain, we still have to remain safe. And I think, you know, another thing that's really important for us healthcare professionals to do is just be out there in the community and educating and engaging people. I think building trust within our black and brown community is huge and that's key to you know, a lot of issues, um, healthcare issues, these issues with COVID. And that's what my team and I are doing. And, you know, just going out listening to them because, you know, it's easy for, you know, someone who's been educated and gone to medical school or nursing school, you know, has a graduate degree to go and tell someone, you know, the common person what they need to do. We need to go and listen to them. And, listen to what their concerns are, what the issues they feel are within the medical community. And I think that's how we will make a change and how we'll get more people vaccinated, just engaging and listening with them. I wish I could say something more creative, but really wearing your mask, social distancing, washing your hands is a huge way that we can um, each prevent the spread of the virus is so simple. I mean, there are many things in life that could require Herculean efforts, but this is something that is so simple to do. Um, so, you know, it's almost, um, you know, of all the th things that we have face, the fact that we only have to wear a mask that can really, really reduce the spread. Um, we're lucky that it's only that that we might have to do. Um, but I would also say, you know, getting vaccinated. Vaccines have worked um, for centuries. Um, they're a reason why, you know, the average life expectancy is in 35, but now 80 and just a couple of decades, um, you know, and along with other advances in um, modern medicine, but really due to infection control measures. So I would really, um, you know, just consider what's the worst thing that can happen to me if I get COVID? What's the worst thing and the likelihood um, of that worst thing happening if I get the vaccine? And when you think about it, you know, I'm, I'm more scared of getting COVID and those long-term consequences. So that's one reason why um, for myself, I would get the vaccine, but I also more so want to protect others. Like I would feel devastated um, if unknowingly um, someone became very ill because of my actions. Thank you very much. This was such a lovely panel. We have now come to the end. I will share my screen um, just to take us to the end of the, the session. I just want to update very briefly the individual in the chats who asked the question said it was confirmed by my dermatologist and I did place it on the CDC daily check-in. So before we end, I also want to put a plug for the COVID-19 for our post survey. Please, if you get the chance, take the post survey. You could also just take a picture of the QR code and you'll go directly to this um, survey. So we could end by saying that the COVID vaccine is very safe. You should have the conversation with your PCP as to whether or not you want to take the vaccine, but the COVID-19 vaccine is very, very safe. We're seeing that despite at the start of the pandemic and the vaccine rollout, that there was some hesitancy and lack of access. But now that we're seeing in our communities, our black and brown communities, 
that there is actually positive move uh, in the right direction that more of our people are getting vaccinated. It doesn't matter if you are undocumented, it doesn't matter if, you have an if you're an immigrant, you should be able to get vaccinated. Your status will not be reported to ICE. We had our previous conversation last about two weeks ago was on immigration and COVID-19. So please feel free to check this out. We are seeing now that um, there are reported blood clots, but this is normal in the population as much as blood clots is a very serious case. It is normal in the population, but we have to report it because it is the safe thing to do. It is the best thing to do so that doctors are aware that, hey, this is going on and they could look after it. It is better for you to have, like take the vaccine instead of worst, thinking of worst case scenario and having long haul consequences. Um, the cases are going up because we're seeing various variants coming quickly and we're not vaccinated as quickly as we'd like. So if you'd like that hot girl summer or that hot boy summer, please feel free to vaccine to vaccinate. And even though you are vaccinated, please continue to wear your mask, social distance, keep that social bubble. And that is with individuals who are similar to you, who are just as safe as you, continue doing that. And one of the ways that we could continue educating people or continue having our black and brown people at the forefront of taking care of their health or being aware of what's going on is if we have conversations like this. So we have to keep um, educating and engaging our people. And like Dr. Smalls said that, small, like Dr. Smalls Monty said, that we she, there's no better, there's no creative answer to any of this. It is just simply to get vaccinated. And if you need to get vaccinated, you could visit, visit reputable sites like www.1nyc.gov, or you could visit our own northwell.edu to schedule a vaccine at one of our, I believe it's 23 to 26 facilities that we have around New York City. Our next show will be on May 6th, and it will be about Stop Asian Hate. We're seeing now everything that's going on with our Asian brothers and sisters. Please join us as we decide how the Black and Brown communities, as well as the Asian community, part of the Brown community, can come together and stop all this violence. We're all minorities together. We all go through the struggles together. And we also always have to help one another and be there for one another. Please continue to be safe, continue to wear your mask, and continue to social distance. And we will see you on May 6th. Good night. Continue to be safe. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you.